This is the Bible with Nikki and Pippa Gumbel, day 345. How you can make a difference. In an interview in Time magazine, the great Swiss theologian Karl Barth recounted that he advised young theologians to take your Bible and take your newspaper and read both, but interpret newspapers from your Bible. When we read, watch or listen to the news, it could be easy to get depressed. It sometimes seems that evil is triumphing over good. The plans of the wicked seem to succeed, while others are subject to the ravages of terrorism, war, poverty and injustice. This is why we desperately need to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and listen to the Word of God. As we study the scriptures, we see the triumph of good over evil. In each of the passages for today, we see that evil will not ultimately triumph. At the end of the day, good wins. Furthermore, in this struggle between good and evil, you can make a difference. From Psalm 140. I say to the Lord, you are my God. Hear, Lord, my cry for mercy. Sovereign Lord, my strong deliverer, you shield my head in the day of battle. Do not grant the wicked their desires, Lord. Do not let their plans succeed. Those who surround me proudly rear their heads. May the mischief of their lips engulf them. May burning coals fall on them. May they be thrown into the fire, into miry pits, never to rise. May slanderers not be established in the land. May disaster hunt down the violent. I know that the Lord secures justice for the poor and upholds the cause of the needy. Surely the righteous will praise your name and the upright will live in your presence. Cry out to God for good to triumph. In a world with so much injustice towards the poor and needy, God will secure justice for the poor and uphold the cause of the needy. We know ultimately that the righteous will praise God's name and the upright will live before him forever. David is surrounded by troublemakers. They are slanderers and people of violence. Some deal in physical blows, others deal in words. Both can be equally damaging. In the midst of this, David cries out, O oh Lord, do not let their plan succeed. He ends this psalm on a note of trust. I know that you, God, are on the side of victims, that you care for the rights of the poor, and I know that the righteous personally thank you, that good people are secure in your presence. Lord, I cry out, you are my God. Hear, O oh Lord, my cry for mercy. Do not let those who slander your name succeed. Thank you that you are our strong deliverer and our shield. New Testament from Revelation 2 and 3. To the angel of the church in Tiatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Tiatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you 
except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation chapter 3 To the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Be someone who overcomes evil with good. As we continue today to read Jesus' words to the seven churches, we see that the battle between good and evil is not only something that occurs between the church and the world, but also inside the church itself. Jesus makes extraordinary and wonderful promises to those who overcome evil. First, live a holy life. The church in Tharatara is praised for its love, faith, service, perseverance, and personal growth. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. However, Jesus challenges the church about its so-called tolerance. Today, the word tolerance is regarded as one of the great virtues and only seen in a positive light. Tolerance is an extremely important quality, but there are limits to tolerance, and some forms of tolerance are not good. Jesus criticized the church in Thyatira for their tolerance of sexual immorality in the church. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. We live in a sex-saturated culture in which we are encouraged and expected to be sexually active and seek personal sexual fulfillment. The Bible has an extremely high view of sex, delighting in and encouraging it in the right context, that of a loving marriage. But anything beyond this, such as promiscuity or pornography, is exposed as destructive and unhelpful. We do not know what Jezebel's sexual immorality was, but these verses are a reminder of the importance of sexual purity. Jesus warns that unless they repent of Jezebel's ways, disaster will follow the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze, searches hearts and minds and will repay each according to their deeds. These aren't simply words of condemnation, as they are accompanied by a call to repentance. In fact, even Jezebel has been given a chance to repent. Where we have sinned sexually, it's so important to remember that we can be forgiven. Our response to passages like this should not be despair, but repentance and gratitude. The church is called to holiness. Jesus promises, to those who overcome and do my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations, just as I have received authority from my Father. Jesus will share his authority with his faithful, overcoming people. You will also share his glory. I will also give them the morning star. If you turn your back on the darkness of sin, 
you will see the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. However great your current struggles in your battle for holiness, one day, with this star, Jesus, you will remain absolutely and eternally content. Second, be authentic. Holiness does not mean being perfect. It means living a life of integrity. It's the opposite of hypocrisy. It means being real, honest, and authentic. The church in Sardis had a reputation for being alive, but was in fact dead. It looked active. It sounded like a good church to go to, yet it had become complacent. Jesus calls them to repent. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. The charge against Sardis is hypocrisy and inauthenticity. The call is to reality and authenticity. There were a few in the church who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with Jesus dressed in white, for they are worthy. Again, Jesus makes amazing promises to those who overcome. Those who overcome will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out their names from the book of life, but will acknowledge their names before my Father and his angels. Lord, give me wisdom to know the limits of toleration. Help me to overcome sin in my own life. May I never become complacent about your great love. Help me to obey you and overcome evil with good. May my name be indelibly inscribed in the book of life. Old Testament from Esther 1 and 2. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes, who ruled over 127 provinces, stretching from India to Kush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. The military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen, fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl and other costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other. And the royal wine was abundant, in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink without restriction. For the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him. Mehuman, Bitha, Abona, Bigtha, Ebagtha, Zitha, and Karkas, to bring before him Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown, in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times and were closest to the king. Karshina, Chitha, Admetha, Tarshish, Mires, Masina, and Maimukan, the seven nobles of Persia and Media who had special access to the king and were highest in the kingdom. According to law, what must be done to Queen Vashti he asked. She has not obeyed the command of King Xerxes that the eunuchs have taken to her. Then Memucan replied in the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and the peoples of all the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will become known to all women, and so they will despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. 
This very day, the Persian and Median woman of nobility who have heard about the Queen's conduct will respond to all the King's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the King, let him issue a royal decree, and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also, let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. The king and his nobles were pleased with this advice. So the king did as Mamyukan proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in its own script, and to each people in their own language, proclaiming that every man should be ruler over his own household, using his native tongue. Esther chapter 2. Later, when King Xerxes' fury had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done, and what he had decreed about her. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful young women into the harem at the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Hegai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This advice appealed to the king, and he followed it. Now there was in the city of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, named Mordecai, son of Jaya, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Hegai. Esther was also taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Hegai, who had charge of the harem. She pleased him and won his favor. Immediately, he provided her with her beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven female attendants, selected from the king's palace, and moved her and her attendants into the best place in the harem. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background, because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day, he walked to and fro near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was, and what was happening to her. Before a young woman's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh and six with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given to her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go there and in the morning return to another part of the harem to the care of Sheyashgaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. When the turn came for Esther, the young woman Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihail, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Hegai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the tenth month, the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. 
watch God turn the tables on evil. One person can make a difference. Esther was one of the saviors of the Jewish nation. She was an orphan. She was beautiful and charming. Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was obedient to her adopted parents. She continued to follow Mordecai's instruction as she had done when he was bringing her up. Her call was so significant that it needed a long period of preparation. Esther is one of the two books in the Old Testament named after a woman, the other being Ruth. It's also one of the two books in the Old Testament that does not mention God by name, the other being the Song of Songs. It contains the account of the origin of the annual Jewish holiday and feast of Purim. It is set during the reign of Xerxes, king of Persia. At about the age of 35, Xerxes inherited a massive empire which included modern-day Iran, Iraq, Egypt, and Ethiopia, as well as parts of India. The book of Esther is the account of a moment in the history of the Jewish people when they were able to turn the tables on those who wanted to destroy them. As Eugene Peterson writes, no matter how many of them you kill, you can't get rid of the communities of God-honoring, God-serving, God-worshipping people scattered all over the earth. This is still the final and definitive word. In the next few days, we will read more about Esther's extraordinary qualities. However, in today's passage, we see how God's hand was upon her. He was preparing the ground to use her to turn the tables and bring about the triumph of good over evil. Joyce Meyer writes, I believe that God has a great call and purpose for your life, as he did for Esther's. Your assignment may not be the deliverance of a nation, but whatever God has called you to is extremely significant. Whatever it is, be diligent to embrace the preparation process it requires so that you will be well equipped when the time comes for you to act. Sovereign Lord, thank you that you are in ultimate control of my life and of history. Thank you that through Jesus, I am assured of the ultimate triumph of good over evil. Help me to make a difference in your plans to overcome evil with good. Pepper adds, the story of Esther is a fascinating story. I've often wondered why Queen Vasti refused to go to her husband, the king. Whatever her reasons, good or bad, it didn't go well. And then all the men became nervous about losing control of their wives. There must be a better way of winning respect of their wives than issuing decrees from the husbands. Perhaps modelling some fruit of the spirit might have been more effective.